While we're at it, if you'd like to turn to your neighbour and say to them, Christ is risen. My Christ is risen indeed. She sees a figure in the garden. The sun has now risen on the horizon, but it's still early on in the morning, and the light is still quite dim. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. She supposed him to be the gardener, and it's an easy mistake to make. A reasonable assumption. I mean, who else could it be at that hour? <clears throat> the sanity of Mary's mind and the logic of her conclusion are beyond criticism. <clears throat> but she was wrong. <clears throat> An explanation may be perfectly reasonable and yet completely wrong. And we come at Easter, we come at the resurrection, not trying to explain it with scientific minds, <laughs> but we come at it with our hearts open. We come with eyes of faith. Many explanations for the resurrection have been given over these years and centuries. And many might satisfy those people who want an excuse so that their lives can carry on unchanged. Yet those explanations are just shots in the dark and they fall wide of the truth. In verse 9 of Mark 16, it says, He appeared first to Mary. Notice that word, first. There is a first appearance, there will be a second, there will be a third. God decides these things. He's been planning this since all eternity in the past. God is a God of order. We see many things that God has planned in certain order in the Bible. He's planned, for instance, the salvation of the Jews, or the gospel going to the Jews first, and then the gospel comes to the Gentiles. And so Jesus has waited. He's already risen, but he's waited. He waits until Peter and John are gone. Because he's decided that the first person that he will appear to is going to be Mary Magdalene. And he's decided as well that the location of his first appearance is going to be in the garden. At the beginning of time, the first Adam was in the garden, the garden of Eden. And Eve, the first woman, the mother of all living, was with him too. But there in that first garden, her eyes deceived her. She looked at the fruit and thought it was good to eat. 
Her mind deceived her. She thought it would make her wise. And so she ate of the forbidden fruit and she gave it to her husband also. Her eyes were open, but sin had entered the world and with sin comes death. And in the cool of the day, in the evening time, God, walking in the garden, confronts them and condemns them. Now a second Adam appears, as the Bible calls him. He appears in the garden. Now it is the dawn of a new day. A new era. There is the woman. <coughs> her eyes deceived her. Her mind has led to the wrong conclusions. But then he speaks. And it's not the garden. He speaks her name, Mary. And with that personal call comes the revelation that Jesus is alive. Now how tempting it is from that moment to ask that question, have you had that experience where the Lord Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, has spoken into your heart and you know that he has called your name? And all of a sudden you know that the things of the Bible are not ancient myths, but you know that they are true, that they are real. And you know that even if heaven and earth pass away, that these words will not pass away. Has the Good Shepherd called you by name? And now there's a sheep have you followed. And with this revelation that it is Jesus, that Jesus is alive, comes new hope and new life, new joy into Mary's heart. The curse of sin and death that began in a garden has been broken in a garden. That scene is being reversed with this new scene. In the first day of the new week, and there, Mary, Mary Magdalene, will become the mother of all living, but in a different way. A mother of all who will have that living faith by believing her message. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And she is the first one to hold the baton in the relay race that will go through the centuries. Saying Jesus is alive. He has died on the cross for your sins. Your past is dealt with. And in him you have a new future and a new hope. We can imagine the joy and the spring in her steps as she ran back. And it's interesting that in the gospel appearances they all run back to tell the others. And she runs back. And she told those who had been with him. This is then not just the disciples, not just the eleven, but all those who are holed up there, probably still in the upper room somewhere in Jerusalem. And she told them, I have seen the Lord. Now, they had known Mary for much of her ministry. She was one of the first group of women who had followed with them from those distant, heady days back in Canada, far away in the hills of the north. And they knew how Jesus had cast out seven demons from her. They knew her transformed life. They knew her devotion. They knew her courage. How she had remained at the cross after they had all fled. And they would put them 
to show you. But they, despite all that they knew of her character, they did not believe her. The first witness to the resurrection, the first baton, the first baton holder, is not believed. And that sentence, they did not believe, it hangs there. It hangs there almost like a death sentence. The words that she had spoken had the power to release them from death and despair and disbelief. That's what they were supposed to do. Yet those words hang there and they've hung over part of humanity for centuries. And sometimes we hear those words. He is risen. And we look down at our belly buttons and we twiddle our fingers. After this, there's another knock at the door. And in verse 12 it says, After this he appeared to two of them in a different form as they were walking in the countryside. And these two returned and reported it to the rest. And imagine that scene. Imagine you are sit sitting there with the eleven. And all the followers of Jesus are there. The women from Galilee are there. Maybe Mary Magdalene is still there. They've been there from dawn until dusk. Ever since Mary first banged on the door and claimed that she had seen him, they have been there. I've seen him with my own eyes. I've heard him with my own ears. I've touched his feet with my hands. Yet they disbelieved and a whole day's evangelism has been lost. And they sit there in the darkness in disbelief. Imagine a church who doesn't believe in the resurrection. Perish the thought. But this is a picture, isn't it? Of a church who has lost its faith in the resurrection. Sat there in the darkness, eating their food quietly. Remembering the times when Jesus was with them but thinking that's all gone. Suddenly the silence is broken. There is a knock at the door. They hear the, the knocking getting more and more urgent. And it turns out that two of their band had earlier on in the day set out to a nearby village of Emmaus. And they tell now of a strange event. They tell how one had joined them on their walk and whether they caught up with him or he caught up with them, they can't quite remember. They tell how his words had warmed their hearts. They tell of the burning and glowing hope that had arisen. And he had consented to share with them their evening meal. And they're gone in, and then as he takes the bread and breaks it and blesses it, it is as if a veil comes off their eyes. And for a few brief moments they recognise him. They see the thorn-scarred brow. They see the nail-scarred hands breaking the bread. And suddenly, he's gone. But as they tell their story to the rest in that upper room, they look round, and it is as if their words are falling on dead ears. Their two smiles are met with many friends. And Mark records, they did not believe them either. We 
might imagine Mary Magdalene saying, I told you, I told you, if you don't believe me, believe them. But after the second set of witnesses, still those words came. They did not believe. While they were still talking about this, old men barely sat down to eat. And Jesus appears, standing right there in their midst. The scene is a little bit reminiscent of the Old Testament when Joseph stands in front of his eleven brothers and they thought he was dead. Jesus evidently thought, they need a bit of help here, they're not going to last until the meeting in Galilee. I've got to speed things up a bit. And he's there, he says, peace be with you. They nearly choke on their food. They are absolutely terrified. They think they've seen a ghost. Now, now, once again, what they suppose makes sense. I mean, how else do you explain that all of a sudden, through locked doors and barred windows, someone is standing bang in your middle? How else do you explain it? Well, he looks like Jesus. You can suppose a natural explanation for something, or even a supernatural one, and you can be completely wrong. The mind, the human mind, is prepared to suppose a lot of things before it is prepared to take that step of faith. And it is a step of faith. You will not get there with science. You will not get there with any sort of esoteric philosophies or religions or superstitions. It takes faith to believe that the God who cannot lie is giving us the truth in his word. Now Jesus gives them a severe telling off. He lambasts them, he scolds them. This is not Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. You can imagine him speaking there, his words aren't recorded. But we can guess it's something along the lines of, why didn't you believe Mary? Why didn't you believe the two I sent from Emmaus? Why the lack of faith? And one day he will say to some people, as they stand before God, why didn't you believe the witnesses I sent you? Why are your hearts so hardened in disbelief? Now, if you were alert to what Mark is writing here, you will see that he's got this pattern. The witnesses, the disbelief, the witnesses, the disbelief, and the telling off. You can see the pain in Jesus' face as he looks at their stolen hearts. Now, when Jesus gives you a telling off, gives you a chastising for something, he is saying that because he loves you. He is appearing to the disciples, telling them this because he loves them. And not only does he love them, he loves the people outside that upper room. And he wants them to go and tell the people. So often Jesus has to begin with his church with that telling off. That, come on guys, wake up and smell the coffee. It is me. Give me some fish and I'll eat it for you. Touch me and see. I am alive. And who is this aimed at? It is aimed at his followers. And sometimes Jesus has to say this again to us. I am risen. 
This is not a fairy tale. It is not just Jesus was a good person and gave us a good example. It is Jesus is the Son of God who has died for our sins, who has risen, who is there, and he now comes to give us new life in him. Are they embarrassed or what? You would be at that point, wouldn't you? The cure for disbelief is that solid rebuke. It's Easter Sunday. But let it not be just about Easter eggs and bunnies. Let it be marked by a living faith. That bold proclamation that Jesus lives. An unflinching and confident assertion of the fact of the resurrection. There is new life. Now, people may laugh, people may scorn, people may scoff. That doesn't make the message any less true, does it? <clears throat> so let us just walk through that, accept that as well. Then, with all that done with, with the rebuke done with, now it's time for Jesus to give the church marching forwards. And he says to them, he says to us, to all who have now seen and believed, he says, go into the world, preach the good news to all creation, whoever believes and is baptised will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, we may not all be free of responsibilities and able to go to the far reaches of the world. But there is a world outside your doorstep. There is a universe next door. There is the world that you walk every day. Seize the day. Tell them. Make the most of every opportunity. Pray for open doors and walk through those doors when they open. Mark begins his gospel with the good news of Jesus Christ and here he ends with telling them the good news. Preach the good news to all creation. The good news is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The good news is that this life is not all it is. I read an article this week, someone sent it on the internet. Uh, you've probably heard of the group called The New Atheists. People like Richard Dawkins, Stephen Fry and that lot. Many of them, this group started about the 1990s, are now becoming disillusioned with New Atheism. Many scientists are realising that science does not have all the answers. Many people are realising that life cannot just be explained away with atoms and chemicals and things like that. There is something deeper, there is something more. There is a life beyond the horizon of this world. There is a life after this one. And Mark is very clear here as he records Jesus' words, there are two final destinations. <clears throat> Whoever is believed, believes and is baptised will be saved. But it also continues, whoever does not believe will be condemned. There are two very clear places where you will end up, in one of the two. The importance of faith and baptism then cannot be overestimated. What words could you add to that to say it's more important? <laughs> Eternity. Eternity 
in the place which is described as fire, which is described as a place where worms will eat you and the fire is not quenched, or a place with him in paradise forever. And so we need to get perspective. Get perspective, think what really counts in this life. There is a new life beyond this, an eternal life beyond this, two eternal, very different destinations, and each one of us must ask ourselves, which one of those two destinations am I going to? And my hope and my prayer is that every single one of you will make that decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ, who is dead, who was resurrected and now lives forevermore and he is coming back. And when he comes back, I don't want to find any of you as embarrassed as those first disciples were, staring at their navels when Jesus appears in front of them. He is coming back, he says, and my reward is with me. So put your faith in him. Put your trust in him. And you will never ever regretted. Um. <laughs>